effectively. Today we're going to talk about the case for automation. I'm going to talk a little bit about what this iSmart program is. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, others may not be familiar with it, so we're going to go over the, some of the some of the details and, and how you can take advantage of its offerings. So I'm going to identify some areas for automation, especially for some of you that might be first time automation um, you know, uh, implementing implementing autom excuse me implementing automation for the first time. And then we'll show you how to build your case, some examples for how to generate RRI and payback period, things like that. Tell, tell a few stories and then tell you what's next as far as webinars and other events that Purdue MEP is going to be uh, hosting. So this is what the MEP ne uh, network map looks like if you're not familiar with it. So you can see the three highlighted there, Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa. Um, some of us are affiliated with universities like Purdue, and that can really help out when it comes to identifying some subject matter experts such as professors or grad students that have a very narrow, sharp focus on a particular topic that, that may interest you. Uh, we also have access to specialized equipment for things like testing uh, on campus that you may not have at your disposal at your facility or in your supplier network. So uh, it's great to be a part of the, of the university and, and the culture as well as the, with Purdue, especially the engineering and technology uh, resources that we have at our disposal. Uh, so iSmart, what is iSmart? So Purdue MEP was granted this uh, award uh, by, by NIST, National Institute for Standards and Testing. And this is a 18 month period with the possible extension. So we're gonna go to at least uh, next November. And what, what this is, is we are focusing on quick wins in manufacturing automation adoption. So we want, we want to bring this initiative to the small and medium sized manufacturers, especially that, that may have thought that automation wasn't for them, that they were, they were too small or was too expensive and didn't have the right talent to, to deploy it. We're, 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 we're there to be a resource for identifying some applications that you may not have recognized initially. And so we're going to identify those opportunities through virtual or on-site assessments and through consultations with our clients. We can help you develop the business case for these specific applications. So we'll, we'll generate a report with, with some financials and number of project, um, projections behind it as far as the actual machine cost, the ancillary equipment that, that you'll need to, to support it. If you need to hire an integrator, for example, if training is going to be required, um, that those are the kind of things we can include in the report. So you have some, some numbers and, and, and costs behind that. Um, we'll connect you with the, the resources such as the distributors or those integrators that focus on that particular niche. So you might have a welding application and we would, we would match you up with somebody that focuses on welding in your region. Um, and then we want to, you know, consult with you on post post deployment. So can we find quick wins in other areas of your plant? Um, what kind of lessons did we learn that we can build on for, for next time? So iSmart is, is, is each of our three MEP centers is, is operating under this grant and it, it's really focused on automation and bringing that to the small to medium sized manufacturer. So you can sign up for a no-cost automation assessment. Again, it can be virtual or on-site preferred, but virtual certainly with COVID, we can make those accommodations as well uh, through video and, and breakout sessions. Um, we would work with you to, to choose some applications prior to uh, that visit uh, so that we can, if it's a larger plan especially, not spend all of your day walking around the plant, but just on the handful or so applications that you think would be best fit that, that you're having an issue with uh, that, that you're looking for some sort of auto automation gain from. Again, those are the three you know, main things we provide in the report, the automation cost and savings, projected ROI and payback period based on the piece of equipment uh, that we, along with the integrator or the distributor, have selected for you, and then those training courses that accompany uh, the automation deployment. So 
We work with plant leaders, so it's, it's typically the operations manager, engineering manager, production supervisor uh, that, that work with us on these assessments. And, and it's, a, it's a conversation, you know, it's back and forth. We'll, we'll be asking questions about uh, your business, uh, about cycle times, about uh, labor challenges. And, and we'll wit we like to be there in person so that we can witness the process and see if there are any efficiencies that can be um, you know, brought out of the system through processes like lean methodology. So most places have adopted lean by now, but sometimes you know they're a little bit behind. And if that's the case, we want to eliminate that waste before we automate and not automate the waste. Um, on the post deployment side, I mentioned the quick wins. So again, this, these are typically we're, when I say quick wins, we're looking at you know payback periods of two years or less, and you know pro capital projects that are uh, under a half million dollars typically. Okay, so uh, in some cases, you know. Fifty thousand dollars. It can be very small. So we want we like to start small and not start start with this huge, you know, intimidating project that might you know, be too much for for you to manage yourselves or you know it's too too cost prohibitive. We want to start with something that we can build on. You know, kind of in baseball terminology. You know, singles or doubles versus you know home runs right off the bat. Okay, so. When we're thinking about manufacturing and, and automation, these are some of those key stakeholders in those areas. And, and this is just a, just a quick summary. Most of us know this, but it's, it's really spelling out how each of these units uh, thinks and what their goals are, and then how automation can play a role in achieving those goals. Okay, so production, churning out as many units as possible, quality, keep the bad, bad ones from going to the customer, in the engineering and design, you're going to you know, use innovation, innovative design practices to, to produce a high-performance product. And in sales and marketing, you're, you can present the customer with a robust, high-value product that you have confidence in. And then the C-suite people, they want to ship as many of those products, quality products, at the lowest possible cost. So how can manufacturing stakeholders take advantage of Automation or Industry 4.0 uh, in general. So, on the design and engineering side, software is is a huge role, right? So there's all sorts of you know automated uh, processes and, and algorithms these days built into design activities that were not there you know just a few years ago. Um, you can use those software advancements with technologies like additive manufacturing to produce high performance parts in only the minimal amount of material. Instead of starting with a block or a much much greater amount of material than the final near net shape, added manufacturing can produce just what is required, and, and that is all. And it's a much more efficient operation. Uh, sales and marketing side, so VR it can bring virtual reality can bring the customer experience, you know, such a such an interesting and unique experience. Especially again, when we're all of us are working from home, or a lot of us are, are working remotely, and you're still trying to connect with customers and finding, you know, that story to tell and, and that impression to make. Sometimes virtual reality can be just that case. Instead of bringing them physically to uh, a, a training room or demonstration room to show your product, you can do that through the computer and, and through VR. And then on the C-suite side, they're using you know all this all this data and analytics that are being captured from the production floor, you know all the way through the you know, ERP and MRP systems, and then enhancing their decision making based on all this data and analytics. So Industry 4.0 is, is touching all these departments in manufacturing. These are just some of the examples. There are certainly more, um, but I wanted to touch on this. We're going to talk about primarily automation hardware automation today and in the production and quality world. So robotic automation and skilled labor combined. So robotic automation is really good for high speed, repetitive, consistent tasks. Um, robots aren't good at problem solving or critical thinking though. And that's where the skilled labor comes into play and, and, and putting those two uh, pools, uh, those two resources together gives you the best result from a uh, productivity and quality standpoint. On the quality side, uh, a lot of automation cells now are building in quality in real time through vision and sensors 
and, and capturing all this data again to get better, right? They're, they're learning from what the tendencies of these processes are. So uh, on the quality side, it's not just a, an operator um, checking each piece one by one manually with a antiquated piece of uh, antiquated instrument. Um, you know, the, a lot of times the automation cell is doing this at such a high rate through vision and sensors that an operator just could not, you know, match that speed and, and consistency with. So um, the quality side is definitely improving with automation as well. So if you haven't started out or you're just beginning to think about automation, what are the types of questions you should ask? Um, for one of the first ones is, do we have the talent? You know, you know, do we have to hire somebody new or do we have somebody existing in-house that we think we could train on a specific, you know, language? If you want to, you know, stick with a, an industrial robot that is going to need uh, a specific type of language to program it properly, um, or do you need a, do you need an industrial engineer to uh, really work on the efficiency of the process and, and, and address safety and, and ergonomics and things like that? Uh, what sorts of gaps do you have currently that you may need to fill with a, with an employee that's going to be your automation lead or one of those as part of the automation team lead? Um, and then what, you, what are you going to achieve with this? So is this for a particular client? I'm going to show you a case uh, later on in these slides where they were asked to automate for the first time based on one specific client, a large client, um, but they, they didn't want to say no to it, and really automation was their only way out. So you know, what's, what's the reason to do it? Is it labor? Is it quality? Are you needed to expand? Um, are you wanting to go and add a shift? You know, those are all common reasons we hear for people that are looking at automation. Um, do you need an integrator? A lot of times people do hire an automation integrator for their first project. Um, unless it's a very simple kind of a pick and place operation uh, or with a very robust um, software package that is uh, very user friendly where a lot of programming technical knowledge may not be needed. Um, an integrator is usually recommended at least for that first go around. And then from there you can sort of, you know, build your own knowledge and, you know, expand that to other applications. Uh, what's your payback rate and ROI baseline? So when we're looking at these things, you know, we like to, we like to know typically where you like to, you know, see these projects fall, whether it's a one year, two year, three year payback. Um, you know, what percentage of ROI you're looking for from that initial capital investment. And then lastly, but not certainly not the least, is the culture. How's it going to impact your workforce? So, you know, most of the time it's, it's certainly a threat as a first-time automation adoption. And, and employees see, uh, the robots are taking our jobs. You know, we really got to watch out now. I'm next on the chopping block. And, and that's really unfortunate. It's it's not the case anymore. I would say in most in most cases, but just because skilled labor and, and even labor in general, in some cases, is it's hard to find. It's hard to keep good employees. So if an organization is, is smart about it, they won't they won't let that person go. They will just redeploy them into a more engaging position. Hopefully, maybe even managing that robot. And I'm going to show you a video later where that did take place at a. a Pretty small manufacturer that has quite a sizable fleet of robots. So some areas where, where you can plug in automation. Um, again, I just mentioned the high value workers. You put them in positions of the more of a critical thinking problem solving instead of just you know the mundane action of doing something a hundred or a thousand times a day. Nobody wants to do that. Okay, uh, at least the people that want to do that. Um, that pool is shrinking, I think. People want more out of a job, especially with the younger generation. Um, plant expansion. So if you want to expand, but you don't want to you know, knock down any walls, you can often do more with, uh, with the same amount by, by using automation and combine several of those tasks into one, one smaller footprint of, or cell uh, that might have been spread out previously amongst different manual operations. Um, Lights out manufacturing. Uh, so this is this might be kind of an end goal, may not start here, but you can kind of see where if you're able to run off peak with a, a task such as machine uh, machine tending or um, moving material around the plant where there are very few workers and there's and there's uh, plenty of room for the for the robot to run and 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 get its work done, 
you know, it can be ready in the morning versus having to do all that and fight the traffic of the normal you know, foot traffic and, and existing fork trucks um, during on-peak, you know, peak shifts. So that's one area that we're starting to see people, you know, look at a little bit harder. If they want to add a second or even a third shift, uh, maybe put one of these two applications in place first, kind of see how it goes and build from there. Um, labor challenges, this is a big one. I think you guys are all feeling that in some way, in one way or another. Um, people not coming, not returning to work from COVID, um, having to hire a lot of temp workers, and, and those are notoriously high turnover positions, and they're doing a lot of tasks that nobody wants to do. So is that, a, is that an opportunity for automation? You know, can, can a robot or an actuator with a sensor or a vision camera, uh, a vision system, take care of that task, uh, whereas, you know, one or more people might have been doing that previously, but it was, again, a very, you know, a very, very low, you know, problem-solving, critical thinking level. It's just a, a physical, simple, you know, movement. Uh, in some areas of, I know in our state where there's a high manufacturing density, you know, these workers will leave over a very low amount of the pay wage promise increase. So um, then you got to retrain that the new employee that once that person leaves. So again, those are all costs that you have to think about when you when it comes to retraining and, and hiring and the time that's put into that, um, you know, the automation, it's just a matter of retraining and retraining the robot on a new project. It's not a matter which can be, can be pretty simple, um, but, but it's not like that but you have control of that robot or you can even redeploy that robot in, in a situation like a, a mobile traditional industrial robot or a collaborative robot that is very easily redeployed and flexible into other cells within a manufacturing plant. And I talked about the high value workers, but you know, a lot of cases you can't, it's not a one to one ratio. If, you, if you're keeping that person around, they need to be able to operate more than one machine, either on a, a start and end cycle, and, and, and they're letting a machine run uh, you know, over here while they're you know, getting the next machine running, and then that's, that machine starts to run, and so on. And so they're kind of bouncing around. and and letting the robot, again, do the, the loading and unloading, which is nobody's favorite part of the job anyway, um, but, but they may be doing quality checks, they may be doing some of the programming, uh, things like that for, for managing those machining centers. Some applications to think about. Um, I'm gonna show, <clears throat> show some videos of these uh, here in a little bit. Machine tending, so press brakes, lasers, CNC, CNC centers and stamping, or are some common uh, applications that we see people wanting to address um, with automation. Pick and place, again, this is one that you can probably do yourselves as far as um, deploying it, and, and you won't need a robotic you know, engineer necessarily or an integrator in, in most cases. Assembly, so think screw driving, riveting, things like that, where you're, the end of the robot arm is, is literally the you know, screw driving, the air gun, or the the riveter and, and the arm is actuating the um, that device just as a, an operator normally would. Again, there's things like positioning the part properly repeatedly every time. So you have to think about how the robot is going to uh, interact with the piece differently than a, a human operator would. So it's it does require some thought and some build out, but assembly is a good one as well when it comes to uh, first time deployment. Welding is one that's really come a long way. I'm going to show you a video on welding um, where it's very teachable and, and um, you know, path, path teaching versus hard coding uh, that requires a lot of robotics expertise and welding expertise. So welding is, is one that's really growing in a lot of areas, a lot of uh, clients, I should say. And then dispensing, one we don't think about too often, but I've seen a surprising number of these on some smaller robots especially. So it's dispensing the proper amount of adhesive and in the right location. Uh, it could be a sealant you know, or for a larger articulating arm robot, you know, we think automotive, you know, spraying, uh, painting cars, for example, but there are other applications in, in smaller or medium-sized robots that will, you know, dispense, you know, clear coat or, or um, you know, top coat, um, Primer, uh, for example, all sorts of li liquid coatings uh, in a in a very predictable, repeatable manner 
that sometimes is required that an operator just can't achieve. All right, so here's a couple examples. So this company, they've got currently the current state is one shift, one operator. It's pretty it's a pretty low wage position, right? So we should always calculate the fully burdened rate here when we talk about benefits. Um, and their future state where they want to be is they don't want to have any operators. This is just to be a fully automated pick and place tasks. And they want to they want a payback period of, of one year. So they're looking to, to keep that cost under 37 grand. These are the, some of their considerations. Um, we talk about the size of the part, both you know, dimensionally and weight. Um, what are the positional tolerances? How are you feeding parts into the robot and how are they leaving the robot? How's that different compared to when an operator is there? And certainly safety, you know, some cobots are meant to be collaborative um, and, and be uncaged, but sometimes if they have a, a welding torch or a sharp instrument at the end, you know, that's dangerous and you have to take the right precautions and, and safety measures to either put up a, a light curtain or an area scanner or even hard caging um, if that's what is, is determined in a risk assessment. So what they found was the, between the hard, hardware and labor, they were at a total estimated cost, 44 grand. Um, a lot of a lot of smaller you know line items here doesn't look like they have any large integration fee but you know that 44 grand is above their one year 37 grand so this does not meet their requirement um, so again that's why it's important to kind of know what your company's baseline metrics are for payback period and ROI uh, here's a machine tending application so this company they run two shifts one per shift and it's a pretty pretty high paying position, right? So close to 100 grand a year, um, fully loaded, I imagine. So their future state, they want a quarter of an operator. So you say, well, how do you get a quarter of an operator? Well, what they're what they're what they're counting on here is probably the operator manning four machines, okay? So or maybe doing another task. It may not be full four CNC machines, but he or she is devoting, you know, 75 percent of their time elsewhere, okay? So that percentage of, of 97 grand is about the 14.6 that we see. So taking that away, they have a one year payback of almost 83 grand. Okay, so they're saying, okay, it's a bigger number. Let's see if we can achieve that <clears throat> through the whole robot um, deployment, all the equipment, uh, in feed and out feed that we need to set up for this. Same types of considerations. So here you've got an end effector which is the piece that holds the piece of material, uh, both as it is loaded and then also as it's pulled out of the machine. So it's probably a pretty, it could be custom, it could be off the shelf. Um, you've got some fixturing involved, you've got the robotic base, and then you've got, looks like they are doing some <clears throat> integration with that, you know, almost eight grand line item there for design engineering. Um, but their total cost came in at under 80 grand. So this one should get a green light because it hit their under 12 month ROI. Um, seeing that, let's take a quick pause here. I'm gonna launch this poll just to get a feel for where everybody is with automation. So you should see a poll pop up on your screen, either at the top, under polling or it should be under a drop down menu um, at the top of your screen. So go ahead and fill that out for a minute or two. All right. So it looks like looks like we've got about a couple of you that have not. Um, some new responses, which I'll assume are exploring automation since you're here, uh, or 
and then one person that has deployed some automation maybe looking to build on that. Okay, so good for me to know here. Moving on, uh, I'm going to show you a welding example. So this customer dealing with some really large parts, and you know they had to they were having some quality issues, and you know, welders are just hard to come by, and that population is you know more and more retiring and, uh, and not enough people, not enough young talent coming in to replace them. So a lot of folks are looking at automation. Um, a lot of these laser sensing, a lot of these welding uh, systems, I should say, have a laser sensor that really acts as a grid or a visual you know, aid so that they, they can identify the joints, positions of the part. Uh, so it's very clear where the weld needs to go and the, the operator can do the quality check on the back end to make sure everything uh, was done properly by the robot. So before, looking at the bottom here, um, before automating the, man, the manual welders climbing on the part and accessing these joints. So, you know, physically demanding, a lot of fatigue, cycle time suffered, um, risk of injury even, you know, was, was there. Um, so the integrator came in and conducted this project and they were able to, you know, again, train the client to identify those future projects that were worth pursuing, you know, because it fit, you know, welding automation and they wanted to continue that. You're going to hear that, you know, seconded by a um, gentleman in the video here a little bit that, that uh, deployed automation for the first time at Scott Feltzer uh, Electronics. And this is not that exact welding case, but this is going to show you uh, what the path teaching and kind of what a robotic, um, what a robotic cell can look like when, you're, when you put it in a welding application. And there's, there's no sound, I'm aware of that. Uh, so I'll just kind of talk you through that here. But you can see that the robot grabbed a light bulb, so a very you know, fragile object. And it's just meant to show you the repeatability there, that it's not gonna bounce all over the place and, and, and damage the good. So just an illustration there of a part leaving the nest and traveling. And now we're looking at a virtual setting combined with the real world carrying that programming out from the virtual setting. This is pretty slick, you know, having these sorts of simulations and, and offline programming solutions available to you, that's, that's relatively new as well. You know, that's it's in the last five years or so that some really, you know, the really robust um, simulations that have come on board, even free applications. A lot of times, it's no cost to the operator to, to get started and evaluate their cell. So, folks like Universal Robots, um, there's a, a machine building machine building application, even that's it's really robust. It's again all cloud based, no no charge. So you're seeing the kind of the dry run there of the robotic welder. Again, one this could be a, a case where there's a person. You know, and, uh, and one welding robot, you know, this is a bit overkill with two robots in a cell, but you can see how they can work together. And again, it's just teaching the path there. There's no hard coding going on, um, you know, from the operator. Pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, the second one, this is a real case, a uh, client of ours that <clears throat> they had this grease application and nobody wanted to do the job. It was really inconsistent. Um, the, the mechanism they were using to dispense the grease was, you know, not precise at all as far as the amount. So, you know, they were having problems and they wanted automation to address the turnover and, and, and labor issues they were seeing as well as the quality, which was some areas just getting missed completely and others, you know, having too little grease, which ultimately led to way too much grease being applied uh, just to cover, you know, just to basically the, ever, the operator to, to, to cover their butts there so they wouldn't get uh, in trouble for low um, you know, grease dispensing. And, and through, the lo through this instructional lost in translation you know, situation, uh, which could have been solved a number of ways you know, through training and, and a new device, but this client in particular chose automation, particularly because of the labor issue as well as the quality. And you know, it turned out to be a success, relatively simple applications, but 
it was a huge cost savings. It turns out that grease was very, very much a specialty grease. It's like 300,000 a year they were saving just because they were over applying the grease and weren't aware of it um, until they put it in the solution that was putting the right amount precisely every time, not operator dependent. So it's kind of a byproduct that, you know, happy, happy, happy surprise there at the end that they also gave them a cost savings when they really weren't setting out to achieve that. But automation kind of shone that light on that waste that was going on. So another example of how automation can sometimes provide you with solutions and benefits that you may not have thought of initially. Uh, this is showing, this is the Scott Filter Group. So again, I'll talk you through this a bit. So a lot of applications here, pick and place. You saw the first one where they were cutting off wire. So Matt is talking about, you know, he wants to expand their business without, um, without having to hire honestly labor that didn't exist in their market. So they had to look at a solution that would work alongside their employers, employees. So he didn't want to cage traditional robots. You know, that's not very collaborative and it would be a, a hindrance. Um, so we looked at UR and their collaborative product that, uh, you know, he's got the teach pendant there. He's again, kind of path teaching. Um, this gentleman's redeploying the probot, <coughs> excuse me, cobot in the middle of a shift and setting it up and then moving on to the next cell. So we talked about one operator managing multiple robotic cells. It's Classic example. This is a potting, um, electronics potting application. So we talked about dispensing with that grease. There's another case of dispensing just the right amount every time consistently. So the operator there is just pinning that robot based on an identified location and setting it up in a matter of minutes, not hours. So that 20% productivity increase he's highlighting there <clears throat> was generated by the robot being the pace setter at the start of the line. Um, so again, working alongside the employees and, and pushing them to meet their daily goals for productivity in a consistent manner, not dependent on the operator's mood that day or, or motivation to, to produce product, but you know, consistent you know, starting point. So she's, she's talking about she, the, the workers nicknamed the cobots Delmo and Louise because they're going to go. They thought they were going to go off the cliff. They didn't think it was going to work, which is you know pretty common. You know, robots are a threat to a lot of the line workers. But now she's saying that <clears throat> they don't know how they would have existed without it. With the increased demands that they were they were able to reshore a lot of products from Asia uh, that that they're able to do here domestically. This is in Tennessee, and uh, now they don't look at any new work that can't be automated in some capacity, okay, or semi-automated. So it's become part of their culture and, and the, the employees recognize the, the value that this, this automation provides. So this is a, a fatigue issue here, carpal tunnel issue. So they cut 16,000 wires a day they were doing that manually. Can't imagine doing that every day. So that's a perfect, you know, robotic task, right? Nobody wants to do that job. If you notice that same robot that was cutting on one end had the grippers on the other end. So it was a, a dual purpose gripper. Uh, so it was able to pick that part out of the fixture and move it to the assembly line or the conveyor line after it was done cutting the wires. So uh, again, very versatile, very versatile product. Um, this is one we did an assessment with very recently. So this is a client in the food manufacturing business and they've got that client 
it's great to have this situation when a client is such a big part of your portfolio. You are at risk of, of um, you, know, you, you see the, the ebbs and flows as they come based on that client alone a lot of times. So if they have a shutdown or if they are cutting production, you're, you feel that in, 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 in a negative way. This is happened, it happens to be a good story because they, that growing customer is just wanting to lean on them more and more. And um, they found that, you know, they can only do that through automation. The throughput is just so high. They just can't throw enough people at it and make it successful. So they're having to semi-automate with, with both operators in the room and uh, what's called a palletizing robot. So what we did was that we identified a, a distributor that had a product that was really meant for um, – you know, somebody that didn't have any robotic, you know, engineering experience. It's easy to program and implement. So they used a simulation app to, to make sure the speeds, the reach, the payload was all going to be met with the type of palletizing robot we recommended. And then they were able to generate the cycle times and compare that to what their demands were for each production volume per shift. So our findings ended up being that, pay, that payback period was about eight months, you know, very short. And the ROI in only five years, and hopefully the, the contract extends beyond that, but over 600000 in a five-year period. So, again, this would be green-lighted at almost at every location, and, and this company is going to you know, reap those benefits of, of the palletizing robot. Here's an example of that. Uh, this is not the same one, but it's a compact demonstration, basically. Um, this this, this uh, palletizing robot is – working with the conveyor and there appears to be a barcode scanner embedded on the conveyor. So again, just kind of a demonstration that it's dropping it, letting it read the barcode, placing it on the outgoing pallet. So incoming pallet coming from the production line, scanning outgoing to the customer. And these, these um, pallet, um, grids or arrays can be configured, you know, whether it's rows and columns, uh, if there's an orientation that, that varies between levels, between each row, all that can be programmed into these, um, you know, into these software applications. There are preloaded um, settings, basically, where you can, you can choose the, the configuration that your client may have uh, demanded that you package them a certain way, uh, or you can do a custom one where it may not be an off-the-shelf, you know, uh, option. But, again, these palletizing applications are pretty um, – you know, they're not, as in, not nearly as intimidating as some of these other robotics applications. So uh, we're seeing a lot of people interested in palletizing end-of-the-line products, for example. All right, so back to iSmart program and, and, again, what we can do for you. Um, Local working groups, our RIA, you know, the, the National Robotics Network, you know, we, we have members there that provide training, um, other educational resources. Uh, some grant funding is available in some cases uh, to our clients for, for the training, uh, which can often accompany uh, robotic deployment. And I mentioned RIA ARM is another one, <coughs> excuse me, is a uh, – Advanced Robotics group that, again, is doing a lot of the same things we are. We're trying to promote automation with the small and medium manufacturers. And then top right, again, our services, what we can do for you. You know, we can do as much or as little as you want as far as getting quotes, managing the project, um, selecting vendors, um, doing the assessment, certainly, but we can, it can be more than just that one-time assessment and report. So um, if you have a if you're short staffed or if you just don't have the resources but you want to look at automation further, talk to us. And if we don't have somebody in that area, we can probably point you to somebody uh, regionally that can assist you with that, that task. This is kind of what that one of those pages of the report looks like. So we'll top right there, we can <clears throat> we'll easily grade it A, B, or C and take a picture of the cell so it's e easily identifiable. It describes some of the challenges we see, uh, some of the automation drivers that we're hearing from you, why you're wanting to do this, uh, the metrics, so hours per day, number of shifts, cycle times, things like that. 
and and then this will will then go back and have a conversation with the the integrator or the distributor to to identify the product that that best fits this application, and then run the numbers based on that product selection. We've got another session coming up, so we're really kind of starting. We've done a few of these webinars. We're starting over in the sense that we're trying to take you from uh, cradle to grave, basically, when it comes to automation. So this is the first one in, in a chronologically sequenced uh, series of, of webinars. Um, the next one's going to be a replay, a similar one we did on Robotics 101, which you may or may not have been a part of. Um, that's going to happen November 4th. We're ho really hoping to do some in-person events uh, even as early as first quarter next year. So uh, where we've got some products in front of you, uh, you can get your hands on a little bit, see the teach pendant for Cobot, for example, um, see, see some of the uh, ancillary equipment that goes into um, making the robot safe, such as a, an area scanner or a light curtain or uh, some of those things that you need to think about for, for the safety side of it. So again, we're trying to we're doing webinars right now. We're trying to make those in-person events um, here in the near future. Our, our friends at IMEC and Cirrus have been doing a lot of webinars as well. I'd encourage you to check out their pages. Um, if you want to jot down this, jot down the <coughs> mep.purdue.edu, that's our web page. And then uh, the, the specific link to the calendar of events is, is shown there, highlighted. Here's my contact information, um, Tim Marr at IMEC. If you're in Illinois, we would love to speak with you about automation, as would Shunker at, at Iowa State. And that is all I had today. And if you have any questions, please type those into the Q&A box at this time. And again, if you would like a recording, you can email me directly and you can share that with colleagues. <clears throat> Uh, we'll, we'll have the link up on the website too to request a recording here in a, a few days. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over for some question and answer. All right. I don't see any questions. Sure, I didn't cover it all, but feel free to contact me directly if you think of something later. And certainly if you are interested in an assessment, again, no cost, no obligation. Um, we're happy to happy to do that for you and, and hopefully make make automation a little bit more clear for you and, and if it makes sense for your organization. Thanks so much. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.